Uh, all right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the seventh talk of the 2024 Invited Seminar Series organized by IEEE Computer Society San Diego Chapter. Today, we are delighted to have Dr. Pahanu Golapali from University of California, San Diego, as our invited speaker to tell us about his exciting research on the use of mobile sensor data in health. This talk is co-hosted by IEEE Robotics and Automation Society and IEEE Photonics Society chapters, as well as IEEE Computer Society chapters of IEEE Santa Clara Valley section, IEEE Hawaii section, Orange County, and San Antonio sections. As always, we have Open Research Institute Incorporation as our media partner for the entire series. Dr. Gulapali has given contest uh, to record this talk, which will be uploaded to our YouTube channel for later viewing. Before we start, uh, I would like to bring your attention to an upcoming IEEE conference here in San Diego, IEEE Sustained Tech, which is taking place on August 27 to 28. Uh, the IEEE Sustained Tech Leadership Forum is a new global thought leadership event with year one focus on buildings and factories in the built environment. The event will bring together industry change makers focused on sustainability solutions. IEEE Sustained Tech is where corporate executives, sustainability officers, technologists, futurists, government and regulatory representatives uh, will find new technology solutions ready for implementation. I share the link in the chat for anyone who is interested to learn more about this event. Now, with that said, I would like to give a brief introduction to our today's guest. Last week, Dr. Gulapali successfully defended his PhD dissertation, so big congratulations uh, to him. Dr. Gulapali is a member of the Mobile Sensing and Ubiquitous Computing Laboratory at UC San Diego. Uh, he will be joining as a postdoc to Harvard University. His expertise is on utilizing multimodal physiological data from wearable devices along with individuals' demographic characteristics to develop digital biomarkers in the field of substance use addiction. Primarily, he works with mobile sensor data collected in both hospital settings and the real world to predict various aspects of the addiction cycle for different drugs. Secondly, he aims to bridge the gap between the sense, sense biomarkers and intervenable actions to effectively help individuals break the cycle of addiction. With that introduction, Dr. Pahano, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining me today. I'm very excited. Uh, today, I'll be presenting my work, um, harnessing digital biomarkers of substance use and addiction with large-scale mobile sensor data. Uh, this is something I've been like doing last couple of years and I'm looking forward for it. Um, so the presentation is going to contain some sensitive images and can be triggering mainly because it's in the area of substance use and addiction. So please be mindful to it. So, um, so mobile sensor data from digital devices, especially from wearables is used every day in one form or the other. The, electrophys the electrophysiological data collected from the embedded sensors of these devices is currently used to develop biomarkers for various applications in health. Like we see biomarkers being developed for sleep, physical activity, heart rate, glucose, and other things. However, uh, their applicability for substance use and addiction is very limited. While, while I pause here, like let's see what's happening on the other side with substance use and its treatment. Uh, in 2019, 21.6 million people in the US needed treatment for addiction and substance use disorder. However, only 10% of this population received any treatment. This is a very large gap, like 90% gap. Why is there such a gap here? Well, uh, first considering the treatment cost, if someone were trying to like look for an uh, residential in-house treatment, it would roughly cost $50,000 for one cycle, like one addiction cycle to recover from one addiction cycle. And this might not be feasible for everyone. Whereas if someone were looking for like in-hospital inpatient treatment, given the growing population, oh, oh, just a second. Sorry. Can you still see the screen? Yes. Oh, okay. okay. I'm, I just lost connection. Can you still see the screen? Uh, yes. Okay, uh, I think 
the power in the room has gone. Okay. Um, and secondly, considering like the growing population of people with substance use and disorders, the healthcare support is limited and just it doesn't match with the growing grace. And um, and already the current medical staff is being overworked. And for the outpatient setting, there's still stigma around like opening up about it and like seeking help. Um, wearable devices like overcome like all these areas. Uh, they're, they're very affordable relatively. They require minimal supervision and they can ensure the privacy of the user. Uh, there are two main areas where mobile sensor data is used for substance use, for detecting the substance usage and for tracking the effective states. Uh, for detecting the substance usage, we have commercial devices that monitor alcohol consumption like breathalyzers. There are also like variable devices that uh, use information from the sweat to detect like the alcohol consumption. Uh, like the one in this picture was actually from UCSD. Um, however, like there are many other substances like where uh, the utilization of these mobile sensor data is being like underexplored. And <laughs> for tracking effective states like related to self-reports, uh, we have mobile apps that monitor mood, cravings, and euphoria levels. However, like the problems with these apps is you have to keep the user engagement for a very long periods of time. And this can be very challenging. And with self-reports, there's always a problem with like tampering, like for personal reasons. And the common issue between like these devices is like the scalability, like uh, the practical, the scalability of these devices isn't like, so isn't like up to, up to the date. Um, my research aims to fill this gap. Uh, like through my work, I'll demonstrate that like we can use the physiological signals to infer information about substance use. This includes monitoring effective states such as craving and pain, which are more of a subject to measures, as well as tracking drug administration, which is more of an object to measure. Uh, and additionally, uh, I will assess the risk of misuse by combining this data with cognitive task data. And ultimately, my my goal is to combine all this information to deliver just in time adapting interventions so that like the individual can use these messages to combat substance use. Um, I also want to highlight that like whatever results I'm going to show, they're collected from substance use data that has been IRB approved. Uh, so everything, everything is done within the IRB. Uh, so now, now that I have outlined the overall goals of my research, uh, let me go into the specific. First, I'll be focusing on detecting the effective states in substance use, the states related to our emotions. Uh, so I started with on-body sensing of cocaine craving, euphoria, and drug-seeking behavior using cardiorespiratory data. Uh, this is a collaborative project done with Yale Medical University. And this was kind of like my first project at UMass Amherst. Uh, so what happens during the addiction cycle? So for an individual with substance use disorder, the addiction starts with drug-related cues that eventually transform into a craving. Uh, and eventually after a loss of control, the individual seeks for the drug and administers the drug. And after the administration, after the administration of the drug, the individual enters a state of euphoria, which we commonly call as high. And with each euphoric event, the individual develops a tolerance, like therefore to reach the same effect, a higher dosage needs to be given later on. And so if you're trying to create technologies that help someone break this cycle, uh, we need to understand like all these components. Um, however, like at that, at that period of time, like variables for understanding like substance cocaine has mainly focused on detecting the drug administration. Like the, work, the works were focusing on like using this cardiac and respiratory signals to predict if someone has administered a cocaine or not. So the work the the works were like mainly focused on like administering the cocaine increases your heart rate significantly. So they were using that information mainly to detect cocaine use. Um, like as I was telling from the addiction loop, uh, detecting drug administration is both useful and very important. However, it is insufficient for like understanding the whole addiction cycle and creating treatments for substance use disorders. Uh, so we, we, in this project, we focus on understanding the craving and euphoria states of cocaine users. So briefly talking about the study, this was again done at Yale Medical Hospital. We recruited 10 experienced cocaine users uh, who participate in a six hour long study. 
So the individuals were wearing a chest band that captured ECG and respiratory signals. So, and during this study, whenever a participant is seeking the drug, uh, the participant would press a button and the cocaine gets delivered intravenously directly into the blood uh, using that pump system. So this, this was done to replicate a real world bin session where the user has a control over the drug and the user administers based on uh, the individual's like own thing. Um, so there were there are of course like few health restrictions like like precautions like the individual can only like click once a minute, and the drug cannot get administered like uh, within five minutes. Like it can get administered only once every five minutes, uh, and every throughout the study every five minutes subjects were asked to self-report their euphoria and craving levels according to like a numeric rating scale between zero and 10. So while the part, so the participant is in the six hour long study with this device, which has a control of like when, when it can like deliver cocaine and the participant is self reporting this craving and euphoria scores every five minutes. Uh, we created a models that basically predicts the self reports of the individuals every five minutes using data from the chest band, the cardiac and respiratory signals. We created a model for predicting craving and similarly for predicting euphoria. Um, so in regarding to like what features to use for these predictions, um, well, for detecting cocaine use, as I was mentioning, uh, the studies were using the morphological features, the features mainly to do with like the shape of the signals. Um, and as the previous works for uh, predicting effective states for substance use, um, it wasn't it wasn't ever done before. So we we really didn't have like what features to start from. So we started with the same set of features that were used for administration, cocaine administration. So for breathing signals, uh, these features included like inhalation time, exhalation time, the depth of exhalation and inhalation. For ECG waveforms, um, as where the peaks and troughs are labeled PQRST. These features included um, the distance between these labels of the height. As many of, like many of you might know, like the RR distance can mean heart rate and the TH can mean the recovery phase of cardiac muscle. So different features have like a different medical representations. So using these features, um, we used a linear regression model trained um, on this set of features to predict this craving and euphoria scores. So in this following plot, it's a scatter plot between uh, the actual craving scores, what the users have reported versus the predicted ones. Uh, we have like a total of uh, seven participants. While we recruited 10 pa participants, uh, three participants, uh, the data was noisy. So we only had like seven. And in the scatter plot, like for each participant, we labeled a different color and we were showing what so ideally we want the predictions to be as close to this uh, x equal to y line. Uh, however, like with the regression model, we observed a normalized means, uh, normalized mean, mean root square error of 17.6% and similarly for euphoria 16.7%. Um, so it can be like quite confusing to see like what's ex exactly happening here. But if we group these codes into like two levels of high and low, uh, by grouping zero to four as low and six to 10 as high, we observed an F1 score of 0.83 for both these predictions. Um, and in understanding which information has been the most predictive for these states, we observed the cardiac signals to be more in, important than breathing. So in the following, in the following figure, what I had shown is uh, after removing a certain feature, what was the error increase in the model? So we observed that mostly after the ECG features were removed, that's when like we were seeing the map, the highest errors in, in, in our predictions. And for example, for craving predictions, we observed the T height feature when it was removed, that was the most important feature. Whereas for uh, euphoria prediction, it was the QRS uh, height, QRS distance, sorry. And the following figures are like the cumulative distribution function plots for different groups of predictions of like the craving scores. So for this particular feature, T height between zero to four and four to eight and eight to 10, when we group into these three different groups, what does the cumulative distribution function looks like? Um, 
So while we were like trying to mainly predict these scores from variables, we also had like access to the information of the electronic health records, the EHR information, uh, and also some information related to the drug usage. So we have, we explored this using this demographic information to predict these effective states. So we come we added this additional feature into this model along with the morphological features, and we observed like what was the improvement in performance. So what we observed was this average dollar per use, which is a proxy for like amount of cocaine use or dependence an individual has at each administration and like how much they're spending per cocaine use. It is a representative of like how much dependence they have on the drug. And using that information, uh, we were able to like predict these effective states better. Uh, Manu, one question about this craving level. Uh, how is it? Determined. Um, so it's on a numeric rating scale between zero and ten. Mm -hmm. So the participants were like briefly explained before like how this scale works. Like ten is being like you're feeling the maximum amount, and zero is like your minimal amount. So the participant like has a computer like the screen, while they're administering the drug, they continuously every five minutes click on the keyboard like what they're feeling. Okay, and, and it like so so basically you expect it to like gradually go from zero to ten um yeah putting the numbers in like you're asking generally the trend as a study goes they'll be yeah, big, more. i mean as a human sometimes it can be very confusing to say that i'm at a level three versus level four or uh, so yeah. So I think like the study we yeah, the study we recruited like experienced users. Mm -hmm. Um so the minimum so in this study, like one of the feature was like how many years they have been like using the cocaine for years of cocaine use. And on average it was twelve years for all the users. So um it was kind of like my understanding is the participants have a clear understanding of like what is difference between zero and 10 because they have a higher experience with that. Yeah, no, no, zero and 10 is fine because that's like the two extremities. I'm yeah, just saying but, like but the subtle also... difference between True. seven, eight and nine, like that's. Yeah, that was a, that, that's a, that's a, a very big issue with self reports usually, um, like how to, how to measure this the same thing like goes with the stress uh our understanding of the stress yeah okay. oh, so okay. people are trying to like replace with like some cognitive proxies um i like briefly talk about like some things later on but people are trying to like find like different proxies for these cravings okay, okay. um and That's um to, to kind of like correct it or like to answer like to add something to it is this click density so the self reports are more like, as you said, like this um, on a scale of zero to 10. Mm -hmm. But in this study, like what we had this unique thing is the subject had a control over the administration, like they can administer the drug by themselves. So okay. whenever they're clicking this, clicking this uh, button, the drug is being administered. So we model this uh, drug seeking behavior by analyzing the user's click density within a certain 10 minute time window, like how many times the user is clicking in this 10 minute window and the user user can click only like once per minute. Um, so what we did essentially is like how many clicks is the user clicking in, in a certain 10 minute window frame. Uh, using the same set of features, we observed like an RMSC of 1.8, like um, it, it means like we are off by two clicks. Uh, and the following is a confusion matrix between the actual and predicted click density. Um, so like what it translates to on a real participant, uh, this is like following is like between the ground truth and the predicted click density. Uh, I, what, what essentially is happening is uh, when we are predicting high click density behavior, like between like eight to 10, we are having a very high accuracy. And we are very, when we are predicting like low click density behavior, like zero to three, um, the model is performing very well. But the intermediate range is when it's getting confused a lot. Um, right, but we can we found that like the high, patterns of high drug seeking behavior, we can detect with a very high accuracy. I um, see. I see. And 
Another interesting thing, something like very specific to this study we observed was a positive correlation between uh, the states of craving and euphoria. So what this means is uh, when the study started, um, the in individuals haven't administered any drug. They went through a washout period where for the past few days, they haven't taken the drug. So when the study started, the participant isn't feeling any euphoric and the participant isn't like craving. But uh, these are like in this in this plot, I'm showing the ground, the scores of craving and euphoria. But um, as the study like progresses, as the participant is taking the drug, the participant starts feeling more euphoric. And as the participant is feeling euphoric, like the participant is also like craving for more and more. So this relation need not hold um, for a large population where uh, these two states are very positively correlated, but it's just the nature of this study. We observed um, this positive correlation and we wanted to use this correlation to improve our previous predictions. So previously we were, we were building models separately to predict craving and separately to predict euphoria. But now that we know these two labels or two states are interlinked or correlated, can we use that information? Uh, so how can we how can we use this label interactions along with sensor data to build uh, to make our predictions better? And for this, we used structured prediction energy networks um, that are generally found to be effective for label predictions with correlations. Uh, this isn't like a very common type of network for label correlations. There are like much more uh, like very new deep learning models, but like this data was collected mostly, as I said, like from seven participants on a six hour study. So given the data size, we approach with this energy networks. So the way this works is uh, we learn the parameters of this network by minimizing an objective function that looks like this. So intuitively what is happening is um, we want to find for a ground truth of Y, we want to find predictions Y bar for craving and euphoria that are as close to the ground truth as possible that is being reflected in the RMSC loss. And the other loss is the energy function. Uh, it essentially tells what are an energy we observe between the input variable data and the output predictions, the Y, the same energy should be present between our output predictions as well. And this energy term has this local and label energy. And uh, if, if, the, if both labels, and the label energy here takes uh, the input, the Y of craving and Y of euphoria. So if these two, if these two labels are positively correlated, this energy term will be minimum. But if these two terms are negatively correlated, this energy term value will be very high. And um, essentially given the positive correlation, we are forcing the model to have these correlations as close as possible. And during the inference time, like once we learn the parameters of the model, um, we, we try to optimize this energy, energy function and whichever Y value minimizes this, we output that as our prediction. So the interesting thing here is that like, um, even during inference time, we are doing a minimization function. That means even during inference time, we are doing like a stochastic gradient descent. So, um, so what happens during inference time is uh, we start with a, a random values for y, like here for this. This is a sample snapshot of one of the predictions. So, the model initially started with like y for craving uh, somewhere between eight, and for euphoria somewhere between like zero to one. But as we are minimizing this function, uh, like as we are trying to find a y which minimizes this energy at each epoch, we are like updating the y values. And um, as you can see, eventually, like after a certain number of epochs, um, these two labels became like correlated positively again. Um, but th this is just to show, um, just to highlight like how different it is from like most of the, for me at least, it was very different at that time. Uh, like we are trying to learn something during inference time. So the implication of this is uh, the power consumption. So the so if if you're trying to do this in real time, you're still like learning. So the implication has on power consumptions. But we overall observed that like uh, the energy networks improved performance, like not by a very significant percentage, but it has improved consistently for both craving and euphoria predictions. 
And uh, what was interesting was um, we were using only the ECG data in this study, not the breathing data anymore. Uh, so we were using 10 participants data and the participants highlighted in the red. Uh, so he, it's a bar plot showing, comparing the energy network with the baseline model. And the ones highlighted in the red, uh, these participants were where the energy networks performed better. And these are also the participants where we observed a positive correlation. And participant four and six, one of the participants had a negative correlation. And one of the participants didn't have any, any correlation. And those are also the models where the energy networks performed very bad. Um, this is just to highlight like more like uh, if a certain relationships exist between uh, mental health states, uh, how to how to use how to create the systems and where can they work and where can they fail um, so uh, going on to my next work a slightly different but related um, i'm i'm co-leading i'm also co-leading predicting states of stress pain and craving for opioid users uh, with my lab mate Yunfei. Uh, here we we are mainly focusing on personalized predictions for the effective states with dynamic branching based hierarchy of deep learning um, so I won't take too much time, but the core idea is a group of users. So a, a group of users tend to have or respond very similar to a drug. Here, a group can be based on dependence to the drug, like mis misusers, prescription users, or something based on demographics, or based on some implicit factor we don't know yet. In this, we use heart rate variability from variables and demographic data. It's okay. <laughs> and demographic data from EHR to predict effective state levels by dynamically clustering the users. Um, so in the interest of time, and this work is still ongoing, I won't go into the architectural details, but essentially for each input, we find an optimal branch that represents the current user state. So um, we try to branch the, we try to group the user's behavior into these branches. And um, based on your current state, you can be like, being chosen into one of these branches. Uh, and once we find the right branch, we try to create a representation from it and like predict. And we observed that um, using this architecture uh, for all levels of stress, we perform better using this dynamic branching technique as compared to like a normal personalization, what we usually do. We observed this the same for pain. Is the where, branching? Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. Is, this, is sure. that branching like data driven? Uh, yes. Okay, so the network automatically determines how to cluster them. Yeah, uh, so it it is it is essentially uh, usually the personalizations happen where uh, we try to cluster the users and we we try to leave the user always in that cluster, expecting like. Uh, but the given the dynamic behavior, how we usually are, um, what group we belong to, like change based on our current state, time, many other factors. So that was the core idea between like this dynamic branching. Um, I I don't know if if I exactly answered your question. Uh, kind of. I, I mean, what I see here is that you have this. I think these are features for user one, two, three, four, five. I mean, is is this like a neural network here for the for, and one branch for each user? Because um, the no, number of the, user the, the branch is not, yes, yes. Uh, so the branch is not for the user. Uh, so the branch is like something like a hyperparameter. How many branches we need to have? So in this in this in this one we were having like 170 participants, and we had five branches in total. Um, but the representation from that branch, um, we are trying to like send it to the user specific model. So the user specific model could be like let's say I have like seven days of data. I'm going to use the first three and a half days for like training, validation, and the later three and a half days for the testing purposes. Yeah, that part. I mean, the branch part I understand. Like the this yep. green blocks of the branches. That's a, like you determine how many you want. But yeah, the, the user specific model is like is it like 
so for every user you have a different model that you need yeah to... so the idea was the the model would be running on the the variable device and uh okay so the initial few days would be the model training phase where we asked the user to self report this states of pain stress and craving for I like see. first few days um because the model is like running on the user this f user or the model is essentially that one okay 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 that that makes sense okay. yeah thanks and i should have been more clear it's okay. um but we we observed this idea of like this dynamic branching as opposed to like fixed static branching it improved for all levels of stress and for all levels of pain and for all levels of craving um uh, so that concludes all the work on using variables for effective states of addiction loop and next i focus on detecting object to measure um and the object to measure specifically is um uh, i look into detecting opioid administrations using variable data and opioid pharmacokinetics so this work was done in collaboration with umass chan medical school uh and the tox innovation lab where they focus on using variables specifically to combat substance use disorder so uh, coming to like opioids generally prescription prescription opioids that are taken intravenously to have an immediate effect or taken orally to have a uh, slower and longer effect when administered they bind to opioid receptors in the brain and when they bind they block the pain signals thereby providing a pain relief however what happens is like if we repeatedly take uh, the opioids or take in higher dosages than prescribed the individual can be at a risk of opioid dependence and this is a very huge problem the opioid dependence and addiction for example um for example like in 2022 roughly 100000 deaths were related directly or indirectly to opioids and the following picture is of traveling mem memorial where they honor the lives lost due to opioid addiction um so so each pill here represents a life lost and the memorial contains roughly 20000 pills and it moves from location to location to spread more awareness um so how is opioid use detected currently there are like two main routes for this the first is self reporting and the second is testing of blood hair or urine samples however like each of these routes has a setback um depending on when self report is happening it's hard to recall the administration and if individual had has opioid dependence like it's hard to recall when the administration happens and if the individual has the opioid dependence it's even harder and with self reports intentional misrepresentation is always present and for the other route the testing method can be very invasive and we can only detect administrations occurring in certain time window in the past and beyond that time window like the samples won't contain any information about the drug and in a similar and, and again like we cannot detect the precise time point when they had taken we only get like a rough estimate um so currently no object to measure exists to detect opioid use in real time uh, we try to bridge, bridge this gap um collaborated with medical researchers from umass medical school who collected variable data using empatica e4 that tracks interbeat interval heart rate skin temperature electrothermal activity accelerometer data and we collected this data from 36 individuals who were using prescription opioids as a part of as, as a part of their medical procedures so the participants had like a surgery and post surgery participants needed to use prescription opioids and we recruited 36 participants and the participants um so the participants were even wearing this wearable data even after getting discharged uh from the in hospital setting we have uh, 20 20070 hours of data of wearable data and from outpatient setting like roughly 900 hours of data for the ground truth of when someone had taken an opioid or not in the in hospital we had information from electronic health records where the medical staff were uh, noting down the exact time of administrations and for the outpatient setting participants were self reporting every day by coming to the hospital the precise timings 
so administering opioid leads to physiological changes. We first detect intravenous opioid use. Uh, the, 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 study, the study conducted both intravenous and opioid, oral opioids, but we first started with detecting intravenous opioids. As um, I'll come later on why intravenous opioids was much easier to detect. But what we essentially observed was from paid t-test, um, different features of these modalities, they're becoming statistically significant. Like once a drug administration happens, the following features um, significantly change. So this pre and post is pre-administration of opioid and post-administration of opioid. Um, and we observed like not just for the features shown here, like for many other features. This is just to, uh, gain some confidence that the signals are indeed being changed once the administration is happening. However, like these changes can happen other periods of time as well. Like a heart rate can change, not just during uh, opioid administration, but for other, other time points as well. And given the high standard deviations, uh, just using these features alone, we cannot tell if an opioid administration happens or not. Um, we design a channel temporal attention based TCN network for monitoring opioid use. So given an input variable data from a time window, like let's say from 100 minutes of variable data, we predict if an administration is happening in this window or not, a binary yes or no answer. And if we observe that an opioid administration indeed happened in this time window, we predict the exact moment of administration, the precise minute when it has happened in this window. Uh, I'll briefly explain the intuitive, like how this architecture works. Um, the first, the input goes through a depth-wise block um, that extracts features specific to each of these modalities um, as observed from the statistical analysis. So the idea was um, the depth-wise block is to extract like whatever statistically observed relevant features we observed in previous step, the block will extract those features. And the next important block was TCN residual block. The main characteristic of this is the causal dilated convolutions. So these convolutions allow the receptive field of the model to grow exponential of the network depth uh, and allowing them like essentially like um, in opioid, the changes in the physiology, they are like short, they happen very quick as well as they're long lasting. So as we increase the depth, we wanted to capture these longer changes. And uh, causal dilated convolutions are something like, which are used for to capture these dynamic changes. And finally, because we are like working with multimodal data where not all, not all modalities can be important, we were using an attention block for channels, the modalities, and we were using attention block for the time because um, when someone has administered a opioid, the effect can start differently for different people. It need not always start at the same time point. So we need to we need to understand like this dynamic importance of the time points. Um, so for that, and so finally, when coming to the results uh, using that specific architecture CTA TCN to detect if an administration happened in a window, yes or no, the binary problem. We observed um, CTA TCN outperforms the models which were built on the physiological features, on um, the statistical features, as well as other time series models which were using the raw variable data. Um, for detecting the moment prediction, which is exactly in this 100 minute time window when the administration happened, we observed uh, a mean absolute error of 8.6 minutes. Um, essentially, like we were off by 10 minutes from the administration time. Um, but because we were using such a, like the, the problem with our deep learning models is always um, like how to understand which, which, which features were important, what ex how exactly the model has predicted. And we, because we were using the representations from the raw variable data, we couldn't really understand which really contributed. So we were using the specific method called gradient dot input. Um, essentially, we observe uh, for in this plot what's happening is, so the first subplot is the, the variable data. And 
in the second subplot where we use the gradient dot input method it gives the importance with respect to modalities uh, so in the second plot um, the higher the fluctuations uh, in a certain modality the higher its relevance and the third subplot contains the information about like which time point is being the most important so um, the high again the higher the bar the more important it is and we observed that most for this specific example at least um, the important time point was observed to be like around the administration time and we observed consistently the signals of eda and heart rate were most important uh, it was interesting because um, accelerometer data which is uh, an opioid opioid administration usually tend to relax someone and we expect significant changes in accelerometer data but um, in this study we did not observe the accelerometer feature to be important at all we observed features of ed and heart rate to be very important um, we also did like some error analysis to understand to understand if there is any bias happening in this models uh, we tried to understand the model's performance by stratifying them across age um, gender the bmi category and for we observed that for age at least uh, the model significantly performs poorer in 40 to 60 age group as compared to other age groups and a similar analysis based on substance use history um, based on which class of opioid use they belong to and um, IBD, IBDU means uh, intravenous drug user so if they have a lifetime history of using this intravenous drug usage and if they're currently using any substance and um, this is just to for us to understand if there is any potential bias and if there is any bias uh, what should be doing next uh, should be like uh, this is this is just for us to confirm like certain hypothesis going forward for uh, to continuing the studies so moving on like i showed like how we are detecting iv opioid use next we wanted to detect oral administrations so the route of administration plays a very vital role in how the physiology changes oral opioids take a longer time to produce their effects compared to intravenous and they last much longer so transfer learning the iv opioid model to oral opioid model did not work very well um, especially for the outpatient setting like we had like very high uh, very low f1 score for administration detection and a very high mae for moment prediction and so how could we improve this performance like we identified two key areas for this first was um, label data in substance use is limited and very expensive um, for cocaine participant data it costed for roughly one participant 100k dollars uh, 100000 dollars and so it was it is very expensive to collect labeled data however uh, unlabeled data un unlabeled variable data is relatively easier to collect and cheap so if we could pre train a model on this unlabeled data using self supervised tasks that understand the underlying physiology we can this we can transfer this knowledge to the downstream task of opioid use and this could improve the predictions that was one of the hypotheses we were going after uh, so for self supervised learning where we need to design design this artificial task we want the task to be very similar to the downstream task which is this opioid use detection so what we did for the artificial task is given a variable data from a time window um, we either perturbate the signal or we do not perturbate the signal and if you are modifying the signal we pick a random time point and we fluctuate the signals uh, either we amplify them or we reduce them significantly the artificial task is a very simple task but essentially we chose this task to be very similar to the downstream task because an opioid administration need not happen in every time window we see it can maybe happen like one of the time windows like somewhere in between 6 am to 12 pm but if the administration do happen uh, your physiology is going to change starting sometime from the administration so we to we kept this resemblance between both the tasks um, 
So designing uh, the self-supervised learning and artificial tasks is not very uh, uncommon in the variable sensing data. However, like the works mostly were doing reconstruction of signals, um, but we wanted to choose something very specific to substance usage. And we observed that um, using the self-supervised learning as a pre-training step, it was able to generalize the models better. And it wasn't very specific to the CTA TCN, which we developed for IV opioid use. This idea was translated to other time series models. And in all the models, we were able to observe a consistent improvement. And this was both for the in-hospital setting and the outpatient setting. However, um, for the opioid moment prediction, which is when exactly um, the administration happened, we were having a very poor performance. We were having like an R square of roughly 0.4 or something. And for oral opioid administration, we were considering a time window of approximately four hours. And when exactly in this four hours it's happening, it's performing very bad. Um, and to improve this, we used information from opioid pharmacokinetics. Just a second. Um, so what is pharmacokinetics? Um, so it's a branch of pharmacology that describes the physics and the temporal dynamics of how our body absorbs, metabolizes, distributes, and eliminates a drug once it is administered. And for each type of drug, it provides these compartment models describing how the body is absorbing and eliminating as a function of time and the drug amount. So in our study, we were using morphine which was which follows a one compartment model what it means is um, both the absorption phase and the elimination phase follow a first order equations and um, in the medical literature after doing like many studies um, like people were able to like confirm like what this absorption constants and elimination constants was however um, to get this precise so this plasma concentration which is the amount of uh, drug in the blood, we need to take the blood sample and we need to analyze. But these equations give gives us an approximate value. Um, like we are aware that like this equation is going to be different for different gender groups, but for different, uh, it can change from demographics and many other factors. But this, the whole idea that like there is this approximate amount uh, and because we know from the electronic health records when the administration happened, we wanted to use this approximate information. And um, the way we did was in the downstream task where we are trying to predict uh, this moment of administration and if the administration happened or not, the model now also has to predict this approximate equation, the blood plasma concentration as a function of time. Uh, and because this is an approximate equation, we were using this as like an auxiliary task, which is only present during the training period and not during the inference time. And we observed just using this pharmacokinetics information during the, during the learning process. We observed um, similarly, not just for CTA, TCN and other, for other time series models as well, we were up significantly improvements in the moment prediction. So this this is this is like a scatter plot showing um, the difference what the information of pharmacokinetics made. Um, so we were using approximately four hours of time window. So you could see two twenty five minutes. Um, the X is the actual administration time and Y is the predicted administration. Uh, you could see that like the points are becoming coming closer and closer to X equal to Y line, and the significant improvements especially happened during the first zero to 75 minutes um, because that's when the time window contained the most information about the plasma, blood plasma concentration. Like if the administration happened somewhere at the very end, um, so the equation, the way the drug is going to get absorbed and eliminated, it doesn't contain enough information. But if the administration happens at a very early in the time window, that's when we contain the most information about the drug. Um, so it was something very cool to observe. Um, we we showed that like, um, so previously we were going after this purely data-driven models 
we were where we were trying to like use only variable sensor data but now just we were able to observe that using information about the substance to this purely data driven models can improve the predictions uh, therefore making them more generalizable for different type of drugs and also like creating like a sort of reliability among medical professionals um so so far i had shown my works that use variable data to measure subject to and object to states of substance use now i look at a slightly different but related problem of detecting if someone is using the drug as prescribed or misusing them um so we collaborated with clinical researcher and um, psychotherapist dr eric uh, the one in the second picture from university of utah and we tried to detect Uh, if someone is misusing the opioids or not from cognitive and physiological data temporal fusion transformer um so people using opioids fall into three classes mainly prescription users misusers and users with opioid use disorder prescription users use opioids as prescribed by doctors for pain relief and misusers use prescription opioids in ways other than what is prescribed by the doctors like this can refer to taking in higher dosages or using it for purposes other than pain relief like for stress for the effect of the euphoria and um oud is a pattern of op opioid use that leads to clinically significant impairment or stress it's a very it's a very chronic and relapsing disorder um like how is someone screened like to which category a user belongs to and the current methods mainly rely on a questionnaire to dsm 5 diagnostic criteria so the individual has to answer a set of questions and based on their response an individual is classified into one of these three categories um however with this method an individual can intentionally misrepresent their dependence on the drug and even if we know that someone is an opioid opioid use disorder or a misuser it is hard to understand when exactly the transition happened from prescription to oud we would lack this temporal information as well um so we try to fill this gap and essentially the cognitive tasks and we we look into this area of cognit cognition for this and cognitive tasks focusing on the attention bias the in like the, the sorry um cognitive tasks focusing on attention bias they sh- they are known to have different impact on this population groups uh, however the past studies were were shown to have mixed results the effect of this cognition on this different different groups uh, why was this happening Because, like the most co- the most common thing among all these studies was they're trying to do the univariate analysis statistical analysis of user responses during this cognitive tasks like they're only trying to understand like what's the differences in reaction times between these three different classes it's it's trying to look at a problem with only one eye we take a multivariate approach um where users are performing cognitive tasks of dot probe and go no go and we monitor the variable data from ecg and respiratory while the while the users are performing those cognitive tasks I'll try to explain what the cognitive tasks briefly are. Um so the first cognitive task is a dot probe task and a trial of dot probe starts with the screen showing a fixation cross and after a short duration two images two images appear on each side of the screen. One image is always of neutral stimuli while the other it varies. Uh here we are using a opioid stimuli. And after a short duration both the images disappear. and um and a dot appears behind where one of these images was previously present and after a brief duration the dot disappears and the individual has to answer which side of the screen the dot appeared and um this trial lof- roughly lasts for 3 to 5 seconds and in this study individual is participating in this multiple of these trials where we are varying the stimuli between opioid pain pleasant and the other uh is how much duration the images were shown and from cognitive tasks we measure reaction time accuracy and from variables we are continuously monitoring ecg and respiratory signals and 
the main idea of the dot probe task is that it measures the attention bias uh, to which part of the screen we are paying attention. The other cognitive task is go no go. It measures a slightly different thing. So, uh, so here a trial starts with an image shown on the screen. Here the image is of opioid stimuli. And after a short duration, a letter appears over this image. M signifies a go trail and the user has to press a key. And W signifies a no go trail and the individuals should refrain from pressing anything. So um, usually we have more number of go trails than no go trails. Uh, it's because the, this response inhibition, uh, like, like not pressing anything, it's a very, it's a, it's a harder thing to do. And it suggests it's someone's relation for the controlling their impulsive behaviors, which is especially present in addiction. Um, and finally, the letter disappears and the trial ends. Similar to cognitive, previous cognitive task, we measured the reaction time accuracy with respect to each trials, go trial and no go trial. And uh, the study, cont study contents where a participant is doing multiple of these trails with a break in between. And we collected this data from 169 participants. And the average duration of this study is 45 minutes. Um, so we, we use a temporal fusion transformer, uh, an encoder-decoder based architecture to assess the risk of misuse from a time window, um, from a time window containing both the variable and cognitive data. We use a time window of 45 seconds. Um, like briefly, the intuition behind the model was um, we encode the features from each time step using an LSTM-based encoder. We combine these representations using a multi-head attention, and we use a similar de decoder architecture to make the prediction. But before encoding the features, we use a variable selection network to, dynamical, to dynamically assign the importance of the input. Um, here in this particular study, we contain uh, continuous data of variable signals, the user responses. We also contain static data of like what type of cognitive task is the user user participating in, go no go or dot probe, and what stimuli are be are they being exposed to uh, or they are they participating in. So this is a static data. So because we were having these two streams of static and continuous data, um, we were having like two different variable selection networks. Um, we mainly use this architecture. Uh, for this purpose, like where uh, we are having two different streams of data, uh, and like we wanted to encode from each time step differently. Um, as the study duration is much larger than the time window we used for the model, like uh, we were using a 45 second window, whereas the whole study is for 45 minutes. So this means that like on a test participant, we have multiple predictions and um, we, we we combine all these predictions by taking their average and assigning a single probability of the individual, uh, the probability of misuse. And um, so using the data from both cognitive tasks and both the cues, uh, if you look at the orange line with the all cues, um, we observed an AUCROC of 0.78. However, if we only use a certain cognitive task or a certain cue, like this is what the AUCROC plot looks like. So the left one is with only using dot probe task. And we observe that information from trails containing opioid queue alone, uh, just using opioid queues, we get an AUCROC of 0.81. And for go no go uh, on the one on the right hand side, if you are using information from trails with only pain queues, we achieve an AUCROC of 0.84. So this is just to highlight that like, uh, if you want to classify misuser or a prescription user, we don't need to we don't need the participant to perform the whole study. We can pick a certain cognitive task and only show a certain stimuli that is enough to assess uh, the score for the misuser or prescription user. So that was a high level idea for doing this analysis. And similarly, we wanted to observe which features were were important for doing this classification. Uh, and we analyze the weights of the variable selection network. And um, for the static covariates, like uh, which task type is it and which queue type, we observe what type of image, what queue, what stimuli is being shown the most important. And surprisingly, for the continuous data, uh, 
it was not the wearable data that was the most important, but it was the cognitive data. And the cognitive data is also from, uh, from the inaccuracies, the error rates during the cognitive tasks. Uh, the error rates are essentially like how, how they are missing the, the main goal of the cognitive tasks. It, that, was, that was a very cool finding we found. Um, so that concludes all my work on sensing from variable data for substance use. Um, and to conclude uh, my work and like the main findings, um, so we showed for the first time that variable data can be used for effective states, uh, especially with individuals with substance use. And, um, and, and most often these effective states are correlated and we show that like using this correlation or this relationship between is always useful. And we showed um, like given the data side, what's the best we can do. And finally, opioid administration uh, leads to physiological changes. Um, this, was, this was a very well-known thing, but um, we were able to build, build a system that can monitor opioid use in real time in a continuous manner. And um, we show that like using pharmacokinetics information to this purely data-driven models can improve the generalizability. And, um, and this combining of this information isn't restricted to just one drug. Um, it also shows that like we can scale this model to different drugs as each drug has a different compartment model. And finally, for classifying users, whether they're misusing opioids or, or not misusing, uh, we, we show like how to combine this information of cognitive tasks and variable data and uh, this system is not task specific like uh, the same in the in the in the in the current study we were using go no go and dot group tasks but the system could be easily extended to other cognitive tasks as well um, so uh, that was that was the reason also why we were using the specific architecture so that it can become more generalizable and a consistent consistent thing we found among all these projects was the cardiac cardiac signals being a very good indicator and um, given like how much uh, the sensing capabilities of cardiac signals have improved recently, uh, like it's kind of like is very assuring that like a possibility that these systems can be implemented on a large scale. And finally, um, the works I published presented so far, they published in various variable medical journals and machine learning based conferences. So if you're further interested in knowing the details, please check out the manuscripts. Um, finally, uh, my long-term goal is to combine all these sense states to aid the individual in combating substance use. And this requires delivering interventions based on this and observing how the individual re responds. Um, so for these interventions, I started like working on it, but in a slightly different domain. I I'll just briefly explain this and like end this. But essentially, um, it, it is the work is being done in collaboration with Optum Labs. And we are trying to deliver physical activity-based interventions for type 2 diabetes users. Um, so type 2 diabetes users have glucose spikes occurring multiple times during the day. And these glucose spikes usually are after a meal, like um, the orange dotted line is the eating moment. So these spikes usually occur either after a meal due to stress, medication, and for other reasons. But frequent spikes can worsen the situation of diabetes and pot potentially can lead, lead to type 1. But uh, if a person were to do a physical activity before even the spike reaches its peak, we can help manage their glucose levels. But uh, if, you, if you deliver an intervention or a message every time we observe a spike, like for this, for example, there are five spikes occurring in a day. If you deliver an intervention every time for this spike, which is five messages a day, the user is going to get fatigued and uninstall this whole thing. So uh, we want to budget our interventions. We want to um, budget in such a way that like um, we shouldn't like run out of the budget too early on in the day, but at the same time, like keep them for like a potentially higher spike that can occur later on in the day. So it's it's kind of like how we balance this budget. Um, so the current the work is currently in in preparation. So I won't go too much details how exactly we are doing it, but that's the whole idea. Um, and yeah, that's everything. And I'm very fortunate to uh, for all the for all the funding I got from NSF 
NIH, College of Information and Computer Science at UMass, Amherst Optum Labs, and Halajilo Data Science at UC San Diego. Thank you very much, guys. Yeah. That's great. It's very exciting and amazing uh, research that you have done. Uh, so, uh, yeah. I do have a question I, that I would I, like I to ask. Over time, I think. Yeah, sure. No, that's fine. So, regarding that cognitive task of go, no go, uh, the, the slide that you had these uh, precision recall uh, results, the RSC curves. Oh. So, uh, there was uh, one, one care with uh, neutral cues. Uh, I, I assume that with neutral cues, you, you'd expect uh, higher accuracy. Wouldn't that be correct? Um, so, why, you know, like, why with the neutral cue you would expect? So, 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 so uh, I, I guess uh, the way that I thought about it is that if the cues have uh, carry something about uh, the opioid usage, for example, that might impact the reaction time or accuracy uh, of these uh, uh, people uh, doing these uh, trials. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's 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 that like uh, the cue makes no impact for both misusers and prescription users, but whereas for a negative cue like opioid or pain. Uh, huh. It like misusers tend to get more. Uh, so for go no go, it's it it is something to do with like the inhibition time. Like you should not press a key. It mainly focuses on like how how like um, like how we are habituated to a certain thing and like seeing that. So it has a very like like why this particular cognition task was being chosen, um, and it's like how the our brain like automatically when we see an image like we tend to forget what we are actually doing and when when shown a negative cue um, misusers like tend to make more errors as compared to prescription users so that was um, that was what is happening with paid cues but with neutral cue we observed like uh, even like when we are doing statistical analysis with respect to their responses and different physiological features we did not observe anything for neutral cues. Right, I see. Yeah. Not, not, uh, so not that was when we concluded that, like, uh, maybe uh, for this cognitive task and for this particular cue, uh, participants, all the all the users, more or less, are, are feeling the same. Thanks. Thank you. So I'm wondering if there are any questions from the audience. I have a question. Um, so it's uh, first of all, it's really great. Um, it's really great talk. It's, uh, it's very nice work. Uh, thank you for presenting that. Uh, so my question was um, the model that you developed. Did you uh, see if it's more um, success uh, this... for new new user versus if you were um, who are working with someone who is uh, like a repeated user and uh, more often resistant? Type and um, how is the accuracy um, changes, or is the model has to change, or it still can predict, uh, no matter what type of user it is. Um, yeah. So, so I created one model for like classifying these users, and uh, there is one model for detecting the administrations. Uh, let me just one model for detecting. So for this project, we recruited for monitoring opioid use. We recruited everyone who has prescription opioids, but within the population, there are like someone who have chronic. Uh, I can show the error analysis plots. Um, yeah, we had like people from different groups, and uh, similarly for misuse, there are like two groups of users. And the way we are evaluating a model was always leave one participant out. Uh, so whenever we are like testing on the participant, we we don't know any information about the participant. Uh, so that was that was a way to, I think like the way we evaluated like is more focused on this unseen, we don't know any information to make it look like more generalizable, like we, to translate the real world setting. Did I, did I answer your question? Like, yeah, yeah, so, thank you. Uh, 
Yeah. So essentially it's the evaluation method. Like we, we don't see any of the variable data or the label data from the participants uh, ever. Um, but during only the personalization method, which we are doing with the dynamic branching, only then we are doing like, we are seeing some information of the test participant. Like the first 50% of the days, we want the user to self-report. But for all the other projects, it's always leave and subject out evaluation. It's like uh, just a follow up question. Like, do you um, like do you uh, record hot types of opioid users? Uh, they are like hot type of opioid they were using. Is there a different uh, types, or uh, does it really matter uh, in the uh, model? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good question. Actually, that matters a lot, uh, especially because like um, in the next project we are using this pharmacokinetics information, and what equation to use to create this plasma concentration is dependent on the drug, what type of drug they're using. Uh, it was, so we were very like lucky, I would say. Um, all the users were using only morphine uh, for intravenous. And for oral, oral opioids, all the users were using only oxycodone. Um, but it would be very interesting to see uh, if the model can translate between two different drugs. But uh, this was also the only variable data uh, with with um, the ground truth opioid use present. Um, and we could only have an information from one type of drug for both intravenous and opioid. But knowing that information would, would definitely like make it more generalizable. Would it be possible to uh, kind of find like, can you find out from the user's behavioral data about what sort of drug they're using? Um, so, in in hospital, like, we have the EHR records, like, telling, like, which exact type of opioid they're using. Uh, for the outpatient setting, um, so for no, the so, outpatient... So far, with this uh, wearable sensor data, and uh, be yeah. because... If I understood it correctly, for this uh, pharmacokinetic information, like to to ensure that you are using the right uh, parameters, you probably yep. need some information about what type of drug the user is using. That's right. right. But but yep. that sort of information might not be available. Like. If you think from a product point of view, it can be just some product. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's only used in the training phase. It's not used in the testing phase. Uh, no, but then, uh, but uh, I mean, can one model? You, can you train a one model with for different sorts of drugs, or you would have to have like separate models for every type of like um, each type of drug? So. If if we are like thinking purely like the way we are modeling, uh, it's just the difference that like each type of drug is going to have a different equation. Uh, yes. So all that is changing is essentially what this equation looks like. Like if we can train the whole network end to end with all types of models in the data, with all types of opioids in the data. The only thing it would change is this one plasma yeah. concentration. But Okay. okay if see. you want to, if you, if you want to like make it, uh, we use usually like if you're trying to create one model for each type of drug, we are reducing the effective data size we can use. And as I was mentioning, collecting labeled substance use is very, very hard. Like, uh, considering all the protocols and like, um, uh, with the population we are working with, uh, it takes okay. incredibly like large amount of time to collect such a data. So we 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 want to effectively like not group the users and reduce the data. Mm -hmm. uh, so ideally, we would be doing that. Is why we are trying to use these branches of users, the dynamic branching. Uh, it would ensure that like we are not we are not reducing the data size as well. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting work. Thank you yeah. so much for the presentation. Yeah. Um, thank you. And thank you for your presentation. It's an amazing yeah, work. I could finally see you guys. Like I was sharing the screen and I didn't see any of your faces.
No, it was very informative. Your research is very interesting. I'm excited to see how you pursue it in the upcoming years. Yeah, so I plan to continue on the intervention space at Harvard. Um, so it's essentially how to develop this reinforcement learning algorithms mm -hmm. for creating test bits for interventions. So cool. it's a very, it's a long goal, so, but let's see. Sounds exciting. Right. Best of luck to you. And thanks for uh, this talk. Thank you very much, guys. Yeah. All Thank right. you very much. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.